America's Heartland is made possible by Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. We take to the water on America's Heartland this time for some unique fish tales and some recipes we bet you've never tried before. Call it a harvest in H2O. Come along as we go lobster fishing off the coast of Maine for a catch of crustaceans. But change is challenging these waters. We'll take you to Arkansas. You're hundreds of miles from the ocean, but fishing and aquaculture are playing a larger and larger role in the lives of American farmers. Sharon Vaknin is in the kitchen to give you some interesting ideas on fish for your family dinners. And we'll head for Chesapeake Bay to see how oystermen there are helping to clean up polluted waters. It's all coming up on America's Heartland. Close to the land. Some people might be surprised that aquaculture plays a role in America's agricultural life. But if you think about it, harvesting a catch in fresh or salt water has many similarities to bringing in a crop deep in America's heartland. Aquaculture contributes to our seafood supply, supports commercial fisheries, and sometimes helps protect at-risk species. Many American farmers supplement their income with aquaculture on their land. We'll have more on that later. But let's start in a classic waterside location. John Lobertini takes us lobster fishing off the coast of Maine, a location looking at change on the horizon. Sunrise is a symbol of new beginnings, but the start of this late summer day demands the continuity of a regimen that's been the reality in these main waters for generations. As the sun comes up, the lobster fishermen of Swans Island head out to sea. Jason Joyce knows these waters well and realizes the work he does each day is part of the past and the future. I'm hanging on to this and taking care of it for the next generation. My father took care of it for me. His father took care of it for him, making sure you, you conserve so that we have a fishery that, that spans, in my case, eight generations. In Maine, lobsters are caught in traps or pots baited with fish to attract the crustaceans. Fishermen often work hundreds of pots a day. Lobster fishing, though, isn't as physically demanding as it used to be. Traps are now pulled from the water by machine instead of by hand. But what you haul up doesn't always mean money in your pocket. In Maine, size matters, and this gauge determines whether or not you can keep a lobster or you have to throw it back. The head must measure at least three and a quarter inches, but it can be no longer than five inches. And there are also rules for breeding females. It's a female, it's got a notch in it, so we're gonna let it go back, find our new husband. Once secure, the catch must be safely transferred to market. Abandon the lobsters, trying to keep them so that they don't injure each other um, in storage. It's a live product that we're sending that's perishable, and we want to make sure they're in as good shape as they, they can be. Environmental regulations and a myriad of laws at the state and federal level have impacted the industry here. Special rope and connectors for buoys and traps help protect whales in these waters, just one of the changes today's fishermen now face. And those realities have prompted a move to diversify. The University of Maine Lobster Institute sees an opportunity to offer consumers more than just lobster tails, using parts that are usually thrown away. A lobster dog biscuit has been an early hit, but the shell may hold the most promise. We add shell material to, uh, to food products in, in a very finely ground, um, like a flour, 
And there are some animal studies that indicate that chitin, which is part of the shell, does have the potential to uh, lower your cholesterol. Professor Bayer also points to early studies on antiseptic effects from the shells and possible benefits in treating osteoporosis. And there's more. Hauling in the traps sometimes provides an additional catch, green crabs known for decimating clam populations. Graduate student Joe Galletti thinks this invasive aquatic species might hold potential as another food source. I think we found a way to mechanically process these crabs and get some good nutrition and good mincemeat from these crabs, uh, whereas before they weren't being used as a culinary delight. All of these efforts may hold promise for this tight-knit island community. A community that pulls together. When 57-year-old Spencer Joyce suffered a stroke, islanders kept his business going. So we all, we all look out for each other. If someone is, is in trouble, or if that boat is you know, having some trouble or something like that, you'll team up and help them go through their traps. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a good sense of community that you don't see in, obviously, uh, a lot of places in the world. Swan's Island is one of the most picturesque places in America, a place where the ocean's bounty gives hope to those who work these waters. There isn't any other fishery that I can think of that can sustain eight generations and still have someone be able to make a living at it. Main product is good product. It's a, it's a conservation-minded, sustainable fishery that a lot of other fisheries around the world strive to be. Lobsters have been around for a long, long time. In fact, the snappy crustaceans have changed very little in the past hundred million years. In the water, lobsters can be blue, light yellow, green brown, gray, orange, or calico. Some even have spots. However, they all turn red when they're cooked. There are many aspects to aquaculture in the U.S. Certainly fishing is both a commercial and recreational activity. That's important to seaside, lakeside, and recreational river communities. I mentioned earlier that aquaculture plays a role in improving the profit margins for American farmers whose land may be deep in the heartland. Let's take you to Arkansas, where research is underway to improve a particular kind of wet water crop. It may not be a location that you associate with the harvest that comes from the water. There are no boats heading for the ocean. In fact, you're not likely to see boats or giant fishnets at all. The Aquaculture Fishery Center at the University of Arkansas is focused instead on helping fish farmers raise better fish at a cost-effective price. Aquaculture is a major industry in this state. Arkansas first of all, is the birthplace of warm water aquaculture in the United States. The very first goldfish farms and minnow farms and catfish farms were here in the state. Today, the, the total farm gate value is about $167 million. Thanks to a growing consumer demand for farm-raised fish, aquaculture has taken off in many parts of the heartland. Factor in feed production, processing, and equipment, and the total economic impact for Arkansas's Delta region is more than one and a quarter billion dollars. These eggs are, are moving right along. These small catfish eggs will be moved to a fish hatchery building for a few weeks and then returned to the ponds until they reach fingerling size. Then they'll be dispersed for various studies. We have a uh, project that's looking at additives to the feed that would uh, then add to the fish flesh. Most of the experiments are management-based experiments so that we can look at what a farmer needs to change on his operation to better his bottom line. A very different research project involves the alligator gar. It's not being raised for eating, but for pest control. Missouri, for example, has got a problem with um, exotic fish and rough fish. And they're interested in controlling them with a native top predator. And these guys, which get to be about seven to eight feet long, are a native top carnivore in the system. Researchers also want to improve levels of healthy omega-3 fatty acids in catfish by including things like flaxseed in their diets. 
One of the problems right now with that product, though, is that when you, when you add flaxseed oil, it does make the fish taste oilier. The catfish product that people like is a very mild tasting fish and they don't really want it to taste oily as a salmon or as a mackerel or something like that. The center also offers regional fish inspections at its four labs across the state. Farmers bring in fish which are then examined by experts. The farmers leave with advice on changes to improve their product and yield. There's a constant networking that's going on between fish farmers and, and sometimes they hear things and say, I've heard that this is fantastic and is it really? And would you set up an experiment that'll prove or disprove this, this, this idea that's going around? The facility that you have here is unique not only in this country but in the world. Yes, it certainly is. There are very few places that have made the investment in these kinds of facilities here to do this kind of research. Mm -hmm. And why is it so important to uh, fish farmers throughout the United States? They have to have proof before they invest money on their farm, so we have to run the trials here. Laboratory studies and models are fine, but they only go so far. Researchers also carry out extensive investigations on catfish production far afield from the campus. The fish raised overseas are raised under very, very different conditions. Quite frankly, they're not held to the same standards as in the United States. Those issues of quality are critical as U.S. fish farmers compete for consumer dollars on a global scale, meeting the demands of price, but also taste. So that uh, what comes out on your dinner table is even better than, than what you might find on the, on the river or, or in a lake. Some varieties of fish are excellent sources of omega-3 fatty acids, salmon in particular. But nutritionists point out that omega-3 can also be found in foods other than those with fins. They cite tofu, flax, nuts, canola, and soybean oils as good sources. There's something fishy going on at your supermarket. Whether it's fresh, frozen, or canned, folks are buying more and more seafood these days, looking for a source of low-fat protein. But knowing what type of seafood to buy and even how to cook it can be a challenge. Seafood generally falls into a couple of categories. It's either caught in the wild, like a river or an ocean, or it's farm-raised. Americans eat about 11 pounds of seafood a year per person. And just under half of the seafood purchased is frozen. 34% is fresh and 23% canned. And did you know that 86% of the seafood we eat is imported? But many scientists are concerned about overfishing around the world, impacting our ocean life. With concerns about environmental impact and food safety on the rise, you'll find many stores offering labels on their fresh fish to help guide your buying decisions. So what's the number one type of seafood in the U.S.? Shrimp. Americans eat just over four pounds of it a year. Second place goes to canned tuna, and a relative newcomer is now in the top 10 types of fish eaten. A fish called Pangasius. It's a type of catfish native to Asia. Do you include fish in your diet each week? We know that eating fish brings with it certain nutritional advantages, but let's be honest, some people don't like the taste or just don't know how to prepare fish in a manner that makes it attractive and delicious. Well, our Sharon Vaknin is in the kitchen with some recipes that just might change your mind about fish for your family. Trout is one of the most delicious and healthier fish at the market. You can roast, grill, or even fry them in no time. And because they're so inexpensive, you can easily use it to feed a crowd. Today I'm making two trout dishes with the fresh and smoked variety. I'm making a smoked trout guacamole and roasted trout with an herby buttery filling. When you're shopping for trout at the market, there are a few things you definitely want to look out for. First, ask your fishmonger if you can smell the trout. It's kind of funny, but it's really important that you do this. So go ahead and smell it, and it should smell slightly like a river or even like a light scent of cucumber. It should never smell fishy. That's when you know it's been sitting in the case for way too long. The second thing you want to look out for is the skin. The scales should look shiny. They should never look dull. And the last thing to look out for are the eyes. 
you're buying whole trout, these eyes shouldn't be cloudy. They should look pretty clear. If all those things look good, you have fresh trout ready for cooking. Trout is actually part of the salmon family, so you'll notice that it has a lot of the similar flavors, but it's much more delicate. It's nutty, it has a mildly sweet flavor, so it doesn't need a lot of dressing up. The filling that we're making today is an herby, garlicky filling that really accents the trout's natural flavor. So once our garlic is minced, we'll put it in our mortar and pestle. I also have some red pepper flakes in there. And now let's mince some of our shallot. Now, when you're serving trout to a crowd of people, you want to estimate about one six to eight inch trout per person. It's more than enough. Now for the parsley, we just want a good handful, the little lemon, some capers for a salty, vinegary flavor. And the last thing we're putting in here is anchovy paste. We're putting just enough to bring out the flavor of the trout without overpowering it. So a couple of teaspoons is just right. Now we just need to season it. And the last thing, butter. This fish keeps pretty moist as it bakes, but Butter never hurt anybody. We'll reserve a little bit for the top before they go in. I already have four six inch trout on a baking sheet with a little bit of olive oil. So all I'll do is open these up and you can see they've got a beautiful pink flesh. So we'll just flip them open and spoon in a little bit of the mixture in each. With all of these flavors, you don't need a lot of the filling. Now when you're roasting the trout, don't remove the head and the tail. They'll keep everything really succulent. Before these guys go in the oven, we'll put a little bit of butter on top of each. When they bake at a high temperature, which is what we're doing, they'll cook really fast. And then the skin will be nice and crispy. And here we go in the oven at 450 degrees for about 10 minutes. While our trout roasts, let's make our smoked trout guacamole. So for our guacamole base, we'll use red onion, garlic, salt, pepper, some of the basics. And then we'll throw in a few ingredients that play really well with that smoked trout. Trout is so good for you because of its high amounts of omega-3 fatty acids, but it's also one of the healthiest fish out there because it's low in dioxins, which is an environmental contaminant. So now it's time to take care of our avocados. When you're shopping for ripe avocados for making guacamole, look out for two things. First, give it a nice squeeze, it should be a little soft, and then push the belly button in with your finger, and if it sinks, it should be good to go. I've got five large Haas avocados. When you're shopping around for smoked trout, you'll notice that it's a lot cheaper than smoked salmon. That's because in general, trout is a lot cheaper to produce. And the reason is because most of the trout that you purchase at the market is farmed. It's not caught from the wild. In a controlled environment, you can really regulate the trout's diet. That's important for this fish because its flavor really reflects its diet. Let's add some lime. We'll also add some fresh minced garlic, salt, pepper. Let's have at it. The reason I don't use a food processor is because I don't want mushy guacamole. I want a few chunks in there. Our guacamole base is ready and now we can add in some of the bolder flavorings. So we'll add in some roasted chilies. These are fire roasted chilies. And we'll add in our red onion. And finally, the star of this dish are smoked trout. And it'll still have the skin attached. You can easily peel it away. Just flake it right into the guacamole by hand. And you can keep pretty big flakes in there because as you mix it, they'll break up a little bit. There's one last thing I wanna add, fresh cilantro. That adds bright flavor, bright color. And because of that lime, don't have to worry about this guacamole getting all brown before you serve it. If you were intimidated by cooking fish before, now you know just how easy it is to do. We've made a roasted trout with an herby butter filling. You can see the skin has crisped up nicely and I've served it with a side of potato salad. And of course, our smoked trout guacamole. Two delicious dishes 
filled with omega-3 fatty acids and they won't break the bank. Let's head for the waters of Maryland's Chesapeake Bay for a different focus on fishing. Aquaculture can play a major role in supporting economic activity in a waterside community. But aquaculture can also play a role when it comes to improving the very water in which the fish make their homes. Chesapeake Bay is home to some 350 varieties of fish, and improving the water quality there is getting some help from an unusual source. Oh, I love it. I couldn't see myself in an office. Kevin McLaren is a relative newcomer to Chesapeake Bay. He moved here in 1999. But this former Massachusetts resident says he's fallen in love with this huge historic estuary and the famous oysters grown and harvested here. We're about 100 miles from the ocean here. We're in a brackish environment where from a biological standpoint, that's where oysters want to live. You get this broth of, of minerals and flavors that, you know, produce an oyster with, you know, I think an exceptional flavor. Welcome to the farm, an oyster farm. Here, where the freshwater Chop Tank River flows into the Salty Bay, is where you'll find Chop Tank Oyster Company. Kevin and his partners hand raise close to two million oysters each year. I always say we're a little bit more like ranching than we are like farming. We're not really growing these oysters. We're just kind of taking care of them until they're ready for market. That care begins here at the hatchery, where the oysters grow from microscopic larva into these tiny creatures called spat. There's probably a thousand oysters in that hat. That's right. What looks like a handful of wet sand is actually thousands of oysters attached to bits of broken shell. After about three weeks, they're transferred onto these boxes made from window screens. They'll grow to about the size of a quarter and then be moved to these floats right on the bay, as many as 10,000 in each one. We grow them for a half a summer, then we pull them out, we split them, tumble them, and put them back into bags at a lower level. And that process continues over two years until they're large enough to harvest. The harvested oysters are then taken to a facility close by where they're washed and packed into boxes destined for stores and restaurants all over Maryland. What's going on, Kevin? What's going on, Travis? Nothing. Some customers, like Travis Todd, can't wait for delivery. They take them right off the dock. Travis is the third generation of the Todd family at the Ocean Odyssey restaurant. What I really, really like about it is the fact that this is our local and native oyster, yet it's being grown um, it's being grown rather than just harvested in the wild. What we have is some uh, rendered bacon and keep the fat. Uh, you're going to add to that fat, you're going to add onion and garlic. Today, Travis is making Oysters Baba Feller, a variation on the famous Oysters Rockefeller. Cracked pepper, lemon juice, heavy cream, arugula, and Parmesan cheese. As soon as you bread these things, you want to get them in the fryer. For something different, how about a po' boy? Shucked and breaded and fried, made from oysters less than an hour from the water. Ocean Odyssey is one of the local restaurants we have, and he uses our oyster in everything because he sees the quality of it, and for him, it's worth it. Chesapeake Bay is one of the world's largest estuaries. It's 200 miles long and as much as 30 miles wide, fed by 150 rivers and streams. That mix of fresh and salt water proved perfect for oysters and oystermen, who've been reaping Chesapeake's waterborne bounty for centuries. But in the last 50 years, population growth brought water pollution and disease. Today, the wild oyster population is less than 1% of what it was in the late 1800s. 20 years ago, some 6,000 oystermen worked these waters. Today, there are fewer than 500. Oysters are considered a keystone species, which means you know, it, it really does, it is the linchpin for the health of the bay. Kevin says oysters are more than just a product. They're an essential part of a healthy ecosystem. The guys who do this testing will tell you that an adult oyster will, will filter 50 gallons a day out of, the, out, out of the bay, you know, filtering it, taking the algae out. Thanks to efforts by dozens of environmental groups, scientists, and government agencies, Chesapeake Bay is slowly getting cleaner. 
But if we could get the oysters back to historic levels, you know, you would see this, the, the, the green color drop out of this water in no time at all. Every oyster that's coming off my farm is one more wild oyster that's left in place. This may take a long time, but it may work. The fact that we can grow great products like this, uh, make them marketable, sell them, and improve the water systems as we go along, um, that to me is just a win for everybody. And that's going to do it for this edition of America's Heartland. We're always pleased that you can travel the country with us as we find fascinating people and interesting places. We've shared some great stories and great recipes with you on the show this time. If you missed something or would like to check out videos from any of our America's Heartland programs, just log on to our website at americasheartland.org and look for us too on some of your favorite social media websites. We'll see you next time on America's Heartland. You can purchase a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this program. Here's the cost. To order, just visit us online or call 888-814-3923. You can see it in the eyes of everyone man. In America's heartland Living close to the land There's a love for the country And a pride in the brand In America's heartland Living close Close to the land America's Heartland is made possible by Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe.